You might ask yourself, does Jesus love everybody, even though he might kill people and do all sorts of other things? The answer would be yes. Jesus doesn't love everybody. Then who gets included? Who decides? Is it you, me? Do my crazy idiosyncrasies get a pass and you're stoked? I don't even want to contemplate that question. You're going to be excited because I can't talk very long. <laughs> Walter's laughing and saying, Terry, shut up. <laughs> no, don't talk. But I have a task to do. And this morning, the title of the sermon is Jesus is Lord of All. When I first read the text, as I do a few times every couple of months, I'm sitting down preparing and looking at all the lectionary texts and trying to decide what I'm going to preach on in the coming weeks. And then the worship committee and I sit down and we play music. Uh, Raul gets a chance to think ahead in terms of what the choir uh, will do. And we think together about what the worship service is going to look like. So if it seems like, wow, that song, there seems to be a theme going today. <laughs> That's intentional. We actually do plan these things out. But when I first read it, I was thinking of a hymn of glory and praise that's expressed in Peter's sermon. Peter, this is the second time, as I told the children, in Acts, where Peter sort of explicates the whole gospel message, right? He says, this Jesus was sent by God, anointed by God. He was killed. He was crucified. He rose again. And through him, God is sending peace and love to the world. In the second chapter of Acts, Peter's a little more accusatory. Because he tells the people, this Jesus that you killed... He's accusing them and telling this Jesus that you killed this time. Peter is having an epiphany to understand what the real importance of Jesus' coming is. And it's not so much that Jesus came just as the answer to the Jews' long <laughs> promise of a Messiah. But Peter actually says that he shows no partiality to any nation, the Jews thought of themselves as a nation. To any group of people, he is Lord of all. And the last couple of weeks as I've been preparing for today, <coughs> it's that not so much this notion that Jesus is Lord that has stuck with me, but the full weight of that phrase, Jesus is Lord of all. We live in a very pluralistic society. America has lots of different people in it. We come from lots of different countries. If I asked most of you, you would be able to tell me the country of origins of your ancestors, right? African Americans have a slightly more difficult task because number one, we're mixed up with everything under the sun. My brother recently did the ancestry DNA task and it came back that we are 49% African, most of that from the Ivory Coast in, in Ghana, in the western coast of Africa, which makes sense because that's where most of the slaves are came from. <laughs> but I'm one third British. <laughs> and there's a little Scandinavian thread in there as well. 2% Native American. Isn't that fascinating? I bought the kit because I'm going to have to do the same test. My brother and I were joking that theoretically, since we share a mother and father, we should have the same results. <laughs> if not, some things awry. <laughs> but when we think about origins, and I'm a big genealogy person, there are people in our congregation, I know Sue's really big into genealogy. <laughs> And even as we look at what's happening in our country around the notion of immigration, we're having a conversation about who's American, right? Who gets to be American? 
Is it just white Anglo-Saxon Protestants that get to be in this America? Tom Hanks did a great little skit on Saturday Night Live. It was actually done back in October, but it was rerun last night. I know you're wondering, why are you up on Saturday night watching it on Saturday night? But I do, because it's a real commentary on what's happening in our society. And Tom Hanks played a dad. He's like, I'm, people tell me I'm you know, America's, one of America's dads. And so he puts on a sweater like Mr. Rogers, and he sits down, and he, he's talking to the camera. And he says a couple of things that are really commentary on the shape of America. And he says, you know, you're getting darker. Things are changing. As though we were talking to an adolescent. But he says, you're getting darker. And you're gayer than you were before. And you're a lot more interested in different kinds of spirituality. These things are true. America is getting darker. There are many more brown and Asian and people of African descent in our country. There are many more intermarriages, mixed race. When my mother was growing up, if you saw her, you might not know that she was African American. But because of this little thing called a one-drop rule, she grew up having only one option, only one box to fill out. And that was black, colored back then. My son is asked constantly, if you see me and you see his dad, is a brown-skinned African-American, people wonder what I am, and they assume that Mitchell is mixed. They ask him, when he was a little kid, he said, Mom, am I mixed? And I would say, well, you've got a lot of different stuff in you, clearly. He said, but you're not white? I was like, no. Not even Grandma? No. And having to explain the complexities of heritage and race is a task that most of you don't have to do. I've had to do all my life, and I understand now the challenges that my dad said that I would face. But in Peter's time, and we talked about this in Sunday school, actually, that the Jews intermarried, had intermarried quite a bit. But no matter their heritage, as long as they were serving the God of Israel, they were considered to be Jews, a lot of them being mixed race. So Jesus was thought to come only for this group that claimed to be the God of Israel. You and I would have been excluded in Peter's world. We would not have been invited to his gathering of Christians on the first Sunday. Because we weren't descended from the right people. Imagine that. Someone telling you, you're not welcome in our church because uh, you can't prove your Jewish heritage. And you need to convert to Judaism first before you are able to worship with us. This is the same Jesus who met with the woman at the well who was from Samaria. This woman who had had five husbands and the man she was living with at the time was not her husband. And Jesus still told her that he had come to bring living water to her. This is the same Jesus who touched lepers, healed them. The same Jesus who invited tax collectors to dine with him. The same Jesus who forgave the woman who was brought to him in adultery. The same Jesus who says that his father has come through him so that we might all have life and have it more abundantly. Peter had a dream. Martin Luther King had a dream. Peter had a dream where he saw all the food that was prohibited by the Jewish diet, which is still prohibited by the Jewish diet. Shellfish, pork, other things. In the King James, it says, Arise, Peter, slay and eat. That which I have called unclean is now clean. 
The metaphor here is that those things that I told you to stay away from, those people that I told you were not part of your group, that's past. Jesus is Lord of all. Jesus is Lord of black, white, Native American, Filipino, Italian, Irish, Scandinavian. Jesus is Lord of gay, straight, bisexual, transgender. Jesus is Lord of male and female. Jesus is Lord of rich and poor. Jesus is Lord of Cook County and DuPage County. Will County, Northwest Indiana. Jesus is the Lord of all. And what do we mean by Lord? This empire language that was actually a revolutionary statement by the Christians. The Roman Empire said, Caesar is Lord. Christians say, no, 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 no. Jesus is Lord. I don't know who you voted for this year. Many of us may be a bit disappointed. There are lots of Christians who voted for the president elect. But even Mr. Obama, for the first time in my life, who I called my president. I've never called any other president my president until Barack Obama, for obvious reasons. But Jesus is Lord of all and everything. Jesus loves those who voted for Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. Jesus loves those who voted for Donald Trump. He really does love all of those people. God loves all of those people. And the challenge that we have as Christians is to figure out how to reflect the love of God to all of those people. That can be a difficult thing. I have a friend from high school who's on my Facebook page who says disparaging things all the time about people of color, about particular politicians that she doesn't like. She posts things from Breitbart News. I'm concerned for Maggie. I almost unfriended Maggie the other day because of something that she posted about Barack Obama that had been generated by bright bark names. And then I decided Jesus is Lord of all. And maybe, just maybe, Maggie keeps reading my Facebook page. And maybe, just maybe, if I keep declaring by what I say, that Jesus really does love everybody. Maybe, just maybe, Maggie might be convicted. I have another friend from high school who still lives in southern Indiana who is not around people of color at all. Her life situation has taken her where she's a, a white working class woman. She regularly reads some of my posts and she says, thank you, Terry. I'm not exposed to any of this at all where I live. If I didn't have you as a conversation partner, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't have any lens through which to interpret the things that I see going around me. So thank you, I'm learning. It's cool, Martha. Thank you for letting me know that the conversation is helping. While we don't always agree, we still have to have the conversation. And so Peter is beginning a centuries, millennial old conversation. Jesus is Lord of all. And we have to embrace that notion that all really does mean all. If we as Christians in this new world that we find ourselves in as of January 20. There are lots of Christians who embrace the notion that people who look a certain way are not included in that all. 
that people who have a particular sexual orientation are not included in that all. That people who come from different countries are not included in that all. There are Christians who will say that Jesus is Lord only if you fit in this group. Only if you fit in that group. Peter says, Jesus, God shows no partiality to any nation, to any dimension of identity. God does not. And we cannot. There is a cool thing that Van Jones, who's a CNN pundit, is doing. It's called the Love Army. Have you heard of it? The Love Army. He's actually going out and talking to all these different people who voted for all these different things. Many of whom say they're Christians. But they have the most exclusive view of what God loves and what God allows. And not only that, but they're very destructive. You may have heard about the black gospel artist Kim Burrell. She's had, she comes from a very conservative Pentecostal background and somebody found a tape of a sermon of hers where she was ranting against homosexuality in a very hateful way. She was uninvited to appear on the Ellen show. BMI group said she couldn't appear on a gospel show. And there were Christians who were saying, oh, well, that's what she gets for going along with the world. There were Christians who are defending hateful speech from a Christian. I'm African American. I understand that the African American community is actually pretty conservative in some circles particularly that very conservative Pentecostal group. But that does not give anybody the right to speak destruction in the name of God. If you want to personally venture your viewpoint, hey, have at it. This is, a, this is America. We have something called the First Amendment. You can say whatever you want to say. But I really want to call into question people who speak hatefully and say that God says that. I'd be happy to sit down with anybody and let's, let's go through text, let's work through scripture and figure out how we can support hatred in the name of God, how we can support dehumanizing people in the name of God. How we can say I'm a Christian but I condemn you to hell. How we can say we love God, but there is no room for you here. I'm really concerned, people. And Peter reminds us so beautifully. Peter, who used to say, there's no room for you with this Christ unless you become a Jew first. Peter said, God has changed me. God has given me a new vision. God has said, all are included. And so I cannot preach the gospel of exclusion anymore. Peter says, I now preach that God shows no partiality. He is the Lord of all. A message from the first century to the 21st century. Jesus is Lord of all. And that's the message that will win people. The message that will win people is that message. Bruce Burkauer, who uh, does a blog post on Christian leadership for the Disciples of Christ, posted something, and I shared it on my Facebook page earlier this week, and he said, you know, I thought that maybe the mainline church was kind of dead because it seems like we've made these strides around you know, race and gender and sexual orientation. And I thought maybe the things that we're fighting for and the things that we think we need to do, people kind of <coughs> accept. And now I'm convinced that never before has the world needed the voice of God and the voice of God's people so much. Jesus is Lord of all. 
Let's live that out, shall we? Let's remember that none are excluded. Let's remember that God shows no partiality and the peace that he gives through Jesus Christ is indeed available to all. Amen.